Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. No fighting man in history has enjoyed as much behind-the-scenes support as does the individual American soldier of today. Weapons, equipment, personnel, all exist basically to make the force of the foot soldier as strong and as effective as possible. To achieve this goal, surely yet economically, our Army is now calling upon a pool of resources only lightly tapped in the past. Foreign Nationals, the big picture study of today. To many people, the words Army and Infantry are synonymous. True, the infantry is the backbone of the Army, for an Army is organized, trained, and equipped for combat on land. Only land forces are prepared to fulfill the Army's mission, to defeat an enemy's land forces, then to seize, occupy, and defend the hard-won ground. Coordinated with the infantry, armor and artillery bring their heavy weight to bear on the enemy. And behind the front line power is a well-integrated but enormously complex force. Men to make weapons, others to build highways and bridges where the weapons may pass. Lines of transportation stretching from factory and farm to the battleground. and communications welding all into a unified force. No army in history has provided better medical facilities or achieved greater life-saving accomplishments than America's medical corps of today. As invaluable as physical aid and comfort is the spiritual support of the chaplains for the well and the wounded alike. For every single foot soldier, there are seven men and women in support working to make his efforts more successful. With the signing of the Korean truce in 1953 and the subsequent rotation of American units, there has been no weakening of support for our remaining troops. While the number of Americans on duty here has been reduced, assistance has been increased from another quarter. South Koreans by the thousands have been employed by the 8th Army in scores of jobs vital to the strength of our defense force. Use of this large reservoir of locally available workers cuts down the number of troops needed for rear area jobs. Moreover, it saves money. Costs of transporting manpower from the United States are eliminated entirely. The 8th Army's operations are made more economical too because the salary outlay for the native Korean is fractional compared to the cost of paying and maintaining a United States soldier to do the same job. Then, too, the wages paid by the Army to its Korean employees results in a welcome contribution to the war-weakened Korean economy, because the Communists, whose initial thrust the United Nations acted to thwart, feed on poverty and unemployment. Our Army's use of Korean civilians acts as a continued deterrent to the spread of communist influence in Asia. This same strengthening of the Korean economy operates on another level. Koreans with special aptitudes are fitted into the working scheme through on-the-job training by Army specialists. With the new skills acquired by individual Koreans, the total economic potential of the Republic is raised. Types of jobs in which Koreans reduce the need for American manpower range from skilled artisans and scientists to special police and military guards. The communist attack in Korea spotlighted our need for supply depots in the Orient when thousands of tons of equipment had to be rushed shipped to Korea from Japan. Although the truce prevails now, one of the Army's biggest jobs in Korea is to protect its depots from thieves. Whether they operate as organized subversives or as small boys developing bad habits. 
At the same time, in Japan, more than 100,000 Japanese nationals are employed by the Army, further strengthening the supply chain which equips and maintains Americans of the Far East Command. Some serve as guards at military installations, while others work with Army MPs, protecting the rights of American and Japanese civilians and military personnel alike. Once a Japanese national has passed his first interviews and examinations qualifying him for a civilian job with the Army, he is fingerprinted for purposes of record and security. In Tokyo, following his fingerprinting, the prospective employee reports to the Tokyo Army Hospital for his physical examination. Included with the physical checkup will be a dental and x-ray examination. When the applicant here, Mr. Shimamura, has been fully processed, he will be ready to join the ranks of civilians who are helping the Army to fulfill its policy of nearly a decade. To emphasize the assigning of military personnel to purely military duties, and to use civilian employees in non-military occupations as much as possible. Assigned to the 22nd Motor Pool in Tokyo, Mr. Shimamura reports first to the Army's Driver's Training School. In addition to a thorough working knowledge of traffic rules, the students are required to be fully informed of the techniques of preventive maintenance. During the several weeks of instruction, the students familiarize themselves with a wide variety of vehicles so that whenever a need arises for drivers of a certain type of car or truck, there is always an adequate number of qualified men on hand to handle the job. Because supply is one of the Army's biggest jobs in Japan, these drivers play an important part in boosting the Army's overall effectiveness. All down the line, the aim is to use more civilians so that a greater number of soldiers can be freed from assignments not requiring military skills. In no area is the effort better affected than in the professions of dentistry and medicine. Japanese nationals, like 24-year-old Dr. Sakuma, rank high on the Army's list of human resources. Dr. Sakuma's education includes three years of pre-medical study at Yokohama University, then four years of medical training at the College of Medicine. Following his schooling, Dr. Sakuma applied for an internship at a United States Army hospital. Following his examinations at the Tokyo Army Hospital, he was accepted for internship at the Yokohama Army Hospital, where he's currently serving. Men of Dr. Sakuma's intelligence and training provide the Army with a rare resource. They fill important posts in specialized areas for which the Army, of necessity, has only limited training facilities. The training period is not so long as a doctor's, but the problems of filling the positions with the right personnel for secretarial jobs is equally great particularly spots for girls with an understanding of both Japanese and English. Girls like Dorothy Nomura fulfill one of the Army's greatest needs in Japan. Not only is Dorothy able to handle intra-Army correspondence, she is able also to bridge the gap between American and Japanese officials. As a combination stenographer, typist, interpreter, Miss Nomura is a valuable contributor to better international relations. Contributions made by Japanese civilian employees toward better international understanding are not confined to their places of work. Over the Mahjong board, American servicemen learn from this oriental game more of the working of the Asian mind than they could from any lecture. This process of getting to know one another better is carried on continually in game rooms provided for the mutual use of American and Japanese personnel. At the bridge table, Cards replace the ivory mahjong pieces, but the interchange of ideas and customs continues. Further insight into Japanese culture is gained at the Ernie Pyle Memorial Theater, where programs of native classical dances and plays were presented regularly. 
Just as the Japanese share the American mania for baseball, so they also appear as a nation of amateur photographers. The average GI shutterbug or lens lover feels right at home. Naturally, the membership of the Lensman's Club is composed of Japanese nationals and Americans. An excellent example of growing friendship is found at the St. Odelia Lehman Home for Orphans in suburban Tokyo. The men of the Fucho Ordnance Depot have informally adopted the children of the home. Every man allots part of his paycheck to help support the orphanage. The money, for the most part, goes for food and clothing delivered by the ordnance men themselves. Every Saturday, the men give up their free hours to visit the home. Here, they turn their working day army skills to repairing and improving the orphanage facilities. For men thousands of miles from home, who may even have children of this same age, there is great satisfaction in sharing with less fortunate youngsters. The informal adoption of orphans by American servicemen is more the rule than the exception in Japan. In addition to their duties with the 16th Corps Artillery, the men of Hardy Barracks, Tokyo, regularly find time to take the children of the Japanese Orphans Hospital picnicking in Tashimen Park. Oddly enough, the men of Hardy live within a stone's throw of the Japanese Communist Party headquarters. It is difficult to see how the red propagandists reconcile their word portraits of the American serviceman with the flesh and blood reality. Men who would rather spend their off-duty time entertaining a bunch of kids at a picnic table than in other more rugged pursuits. Just as the informal adopting of an entire orphanage by United States Army units is a common occurrence, so too legal adoptions by American servicemen and their wives are becoming equally commonplace. Picnics like these lay the groundwork for mutual affection. Mutual cooperation is the key word in describing American military and Japanese business interests in Japan. Jobs are created indirectly for thousands of Japanese nationals through American supplied ideas. With an enormous population concentrated in a small area, the Japanese traditionally have been masters of the miniature. The export firm of Marusan Shoten, alert to possible new products and potential markets, is currently making good use of a suggestion provided by an American Army officer. Because the United States is world-renowned for its automobiles, for both design and mass production, the manufacturing of miniature American cars seemed like a fine prospect for a product with a universal appeal. Acting on this suggestion, Marusan Shoten Limited added miniatures of American automobiles to its list of products. Every toy is an exact duplicate on a fractional scale. Furthermore, the cars actually run. The idea, suggested by an American army officer, pursued and developed by an ingenious and far-sighted Japanese businessman, has already enjoyed considerable success. By cooperating with small businesses in this and similar ways, Japan is helped to stay free of the influence of her communist-dominated neighbors on the continent of Asia. The toy automobile is small in itself, but combined with other products and multiplied by the thousands, it becomes an important weight in the balance of world trade. The same initiative shown by the small businessmen in Japan is displayed by individual workers employed by the Army at the Apama Ordnance Depot. Here, civilian employees have established a training school on their own. The new skills acquired in these classes furthers the individual worker's chances of advancement in his line of work. Not only that, the beneficial results of such classes are seen in the figures. For every American job, there are 10 Japanese workmen.
On the other side of the world, foreign nationals give additional strength to the United States Army. At Kaiserslautern in Western Germany is the largest single complex of field supply installations in the world. Here are concentrated millions of dollars worth of supply dumps and depots, arsenals and repair shops, open and concealed warehouses, petrol dumps, barracks and maneuver grounds. Supplies and weapons range from the obvious to top secret, above ground, on the ground and below ground. At the Western Area Command Headquarters at Kaiserslautern, close to France and west of the Rhine River, a veritable electronic and mechanical army within an army is needed to keep tabs on the myriad items kept on hand to meet the need of the army. The primary mission here is the receiving, storing, breakdown and issue of supplies and equipment. This is a service command backing up our combat-ready army in Europe. In and around Kaiserslautern are found mile after mile of new railroad track and paved military highways. Great loads are being transshipped from nearby railheads or being brought in in trucks from receiving centers in France. The Kaiserslautern area is noted for its size. However, much of the building expense came from German paid occupation costs and most of the manpower for construction and maintenance is supplied by German nationals. There are more than 300 types of jobs open to the citizens of the new German Republic. When a department head needs a man to fill a particular job, he first contacts the employee utilization office in his area. This triggers a chain reaction aimed at getting the right man for the right job as speedily as possible. Currently, there's an opening for a fireman. Responding to an advertisement placed in a local newspaper, Joseph Mueller reports to the Employee Utilization Office, where the initial information about his background, education, and job experience is elicited. Because Mueller appears qualified, he moves to the third phase of screening. If he passes the series of interviews ahead of him, he will join the more than 11,000 German civilians employed by the Army in the Kaiserslautern area alone the more than 130,000 foreign nationals augmenting American military and civilian personnel in Europe. While Mueller receives his second screening interview, G2, Army Intelligence, receives a copy of his application form. When his statements are checked out against the records, Mueller receives his security clearance. At this point, Mr. Mueller's prospects for the job look good. He returns to the Employee Utilization Bureau, where he is briefed on matters of salary, possibilities for advancement, and on the job procedure. He will put in a trial period on the job before he goes on the payroll officially. The advantages in employing a civilian for a job like Mueller's are plain. He will put in a full work week with overtime if necessary, and will not be diverted by combat instruction or other activities required of military personnel. From the Bureau, Mueller reports to the firehouse in Vogelway where he will be stationed. Although civilians like Mueller do not enlist for a prescribed length of time, there is a better than average chance that he will make firefighting his career. The foreign nationals who man Vogelway's fire department are a vital adjunct to the United States Army in Germany. For Vogelway is a uniquely important military installation. In the summer of 1950, while the United States was deeply involved in the Korean conflict, earth-moving equipment went to work in the farmland near the ancient town of Barbarossa. Six army divisions were on their way to Germany from the United States to prevent another Korea in Europe. The land cleared was one day to become the town of Vogelway, an integral part of Operation Palatine, the coverall term for the total military installation in the Kaiserslautern area. On the original blueprints and specifications, the town of Vogelway was slated to house more than 12,000 people. The actual construction work was done by French, German, and American subcontractors employing, for the most part, 
local German artisans and laborers. Vogelway today is a city in itself, composed of more than a hundred four-story apartment buildings. Each of these houses is a city block long, strung out along a maze of winding streets which enclose and isolate the community. In Vogelway are schools and athletic fields, shopping center and a 1,000-seat theater, post office and police station, gymnasium and beauty parlor, a chapel for all faiths, and super filling stations run by the Army Quartermaster Corps. The schools range from kindergarten through high school with recreation facilities for all ages. Vogelway is big, bigger in fact than many of the hometowns from which come its inhabitants, the soldiers and their dependents. It's far bigger than the older surrounding German communities. Frequently it's called Little America. If it weren't for the military legends on the buildings, the busy super shopping center might be mistaken for one in any suburban community at home, from Long Island to South Los Angeles. In the quartermaster commissary are found all the brand name goods advertised at home on television and in the newspapers. On the surface, Vogelway is suburbia. Fundamentally, it is the center of a mighty military installation which stands as a bulwark of security in the heartland of Europe. Because Vogelway is essentially a military establishment, the living quarters of thousands of Americans, some of the individual tenants' responsibilities are lightened so that the soldiers can devote full time to their proper business, soldiering. Servicing the buildings of Vogelway, therefore, is a preventive maintenance organization manned entirely by German nationals with special skills. Members of the preventive maintenance teams are prepared to install or repair electric wiring and windows in addition to plumbing fixtures. Maintaining an American soldier in any one of these necessary maintenance jobs would cost around $5,000 a year. For a German national, the cost is a fraction of this. Of course, in any community where you have several thousand married couples, you're bound to find additional thousands of children. And where there are lots of children, there are bound to be dogs, lots and lots of dogs. And to carry this logic a bit further, where there are dogs by the yard, even dogs by the mile, Bowser or Fido, or call him what you will, at some time or another is going to need medical attention. So at Vogelway, not even the needs of the dog population are overlooked. The veterinarian clinic is manned by German nationals. Naturally, who better to care for a luckless dachshund? In Vogelway, the little touches of home are there for the married soldier. But what of the unmarried private, the bachelor captain, who darns the holes in his socks or affectionately sews on the insignia denoting a promotion in the military world? Here again, the civilian population, the small business enterprise supplies the answer. Cleaning, pressing, and tailoring shops managed by German nationals operate to meet the demand. For every branch of the army operating in the Palatinate, there is a pool of civilian labor to augment military duties. Experienced German linemen help keep the Signal Corps communication channels open. Civilian firemen protect both American military and civilian property. This is civilian Joseph Mueller's first response to a fire alarm since joining the Vogelway Fire Department. 
He is still in the two-week trial period before his name goes on the list of regular civilian army employees. But because of his past firefighting experience and the initiative and sense of responsibility displayed in his first days on the job, chances are very good that Mueller will become a dependable member of the Vogelway Fire Squad. Mueller's income and the income of the tens of thousands of foreign nationals like him does much to strengthen the economy of the new German Republic, which stands in the shadow cast by the Soviet Union's arsenal to the east. At the same time, our own economy is strengthened at home. Our outlay of tax-garnered money for military costs are reduced because the jobs undertaken by foreign nationals are performed more economically than they could be either by American civilians or military personnel on foreign soil. Moreover, our resources of skilled technicians and professional people in the United States remain strong, a healthy nucleus for expansion in an emergency, for defense in case of attack, for immediate mobilization to strike back. Equally important, foreign nationals working for and with the United States Army, wherever it is stationed around the world, cannot help but to know and understand better Americans, our ideals, our sentiments and hopes. And for every foreign national in civilian garb, an American soldier in uniform is freed to serve his basic purpose, to defend, to take, to hold the land. The policy of employing foreign nationals as a supporting force for the United States Army has four key benefits. The program makes our total operation more economical. At home, it keeps America's force of skilled labor strong. Equally important, it strengthens the economy and fosters the ties of friendship in the countries abroad where the American soldier serves today. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us again next week when we will present another look at your army in action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.